Hey there, hi there, ho there, touch designer programmers. All right, Matthew here. Now, that last uh, installment there went pretty fast. We, I, of course, program very fast. I know that's a part of the way that I work. Um, and that's one of the joys of having something like YouTube. You can go back and watch it again if you need to. The way that uh, the place that we started was, was just to draw this grid, right? So we just went ahead and draw, drew this grid. And imagine that this is something that we might want to have as pixels. Or imagine that each one of these circles might uh, represent a single pixel. So how can we push that idea a little bit further? So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add another base. And we're going to do all of our image processing in this base now. And I'm going to go ahead and give it a name like process. And I'm going to give it a color also. And I'm making it purple because it's going to be mostly tops that are inside of this thing. And so uh, that kind of color coding helps me understand where I am and what's going on. With that in mind, let's go ahead and dive inside here and see what we can um, kind of figure out to do. So the first thing we're going to do is well, let's just draw a circle. We're going to draw a circle to get started. We're going to go ahead and uh, add that right here to our network. And now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and think about how we can take this and apply it out here to this larger uh, array. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to think about, well, what is this grid? represent, right? How do we think about that grid and how do we translate that into something that we can kind of feed any image that we want to? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and add a fit top. So we're going to add a fit top over here on the left inside of process. And our fit, we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to kind of build in some uh, dependent elements here. And we're going to make sure that the fit, right, the size of the canvas that we're drawing, the resolution of this, matches what's happening over here in our instances. So we want to match grid one over here. So let's write some interesting expressions. So the first expression we're going to start with is operator. And we want to go up one. Then we want to look at instances. And we want to look at grid one. Now, in grid one, I want the parameter called columns, calls. Now, calls, as we'll see over here, right, is 40. That's going to be my width, right? Columns, chump, 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 chump. That's the width that I have. And I'm going to go ahead and just copy this. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to copy this, and we're going to add rows here to the left uh, in our second parameter for our height, right? Rows, choo, 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 choo. So we have our width and our height. So that's allowing us to think of this grid as being the, the resolution, the target resolution that we're going to draw this uh, puppy down to. Now, in our fit parameter, we might go ahead and say something like fit outside or fit best or fill. Um, we'll come back to that as we start to feed that with other things. For now, though, um, we've gone ahead and got this puppy up and working. That is excellent. Now, I am in the habit these days of color coding things in another way to help me understand what's going on in my networks. And I would encourage you to do something like this as well, especially as your networks become a little bit larger. So in this fit, I'm going to go ahead and give it this cyan color. So I know that it's got references in here um, that are in another network. If it's inside the same network, um, you get uh, export lines, which makes it easy to see. But when you're in separate networks, it can be difficult to know uh, what's going on. In my grid, I'm going to go ahead and give it an orange color so I know that it's actually um, pushing information out to another operator in another network. This is just a way that I've come up with to help uh, kind of visually see at a glance uh, what operators are communicating with other networks somewhere. All right, let's go ahead and add a null. Uh, and we can just go ahead and leave it uh, as null1. Now, over here in our instances, we need to go ahead and do one other thing. So in instances, we're going to grab a top to chop. Because now we're going to take this information that we're drawing over here as pixels, and we're going to convert that into uh, some chop data so we can use it to drive our instances. Now, uh, let's go ahead and grab this, drag it and drop it right over. Relative. Now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and give this a, uh, a cyan color so that I know that it's grabbing from somewhere else. And my top, or yeah, my null top, I'm also going to give it an orange color so I know that it's talking to someplace else. 
I need to change a couple other things here. So in my top two, I want to go ahead and choose next frame. It's a little bit faster. Uh, for my crop, I want to do the full image. Now I don't want to, I don't need to actually see that, and it's actually pretty expensive to look at this, this viewer for this thing all the time. Um, and I don't particularly care about seeing this viewer. It's really hard to uh, kind of see anyway. So let's go ahead and take this. Um, we'll make it viewer active one more time, and we'll turn it off. We don't need to see it. Perfect. All right. Now let's go ahead and shuffle. So by using a shuffle chop, we can actually sequence these uh, this information together. If we go ahead and sequence all channels, um, we can go ahead and see this in a slightly different way. And let's make sure that we have everything set up here correctly. Oh, I want to sequence channels by name. That's what I want to do. There we go. Perfect. And I got. You can see that I've got R G B and A here. Uh, if we middle mouse click on here, we can see that we've got uh, 1,200 samples. If we were to double check up here, we see that we've got 1,200 samples. That's great. We've got a matching number of samples between these two, which is exactly what we want. Now I'm going to go ahead and scoot this null over here, over a little bit. I'm going to insert a merge because we need to merge in all of our data so it's in a single uh, channel operator here. And we can go ahead and plug our shuffled information right into here, right? And that's actually the pixel representation or the all the pixel information that's coming out of this guy. Now we've looked at what this means before, right? If we were to look at a dat here, for example, and we were to look at a chop2, we can see that uh, this array of information, right? These rows and columns uh, represent the pixel coordinates, right? It's zero, 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 zero. The pixel coordinates and all of the information that we have about what's going on over here. So we're really just looking at another way of visualizing the information inside of this top, which is great. That's really handy. So let's go ahead and close this puppy up and move out over here. Now let's go over to our geo, and in our geo, we now should be able to um, go ahead and look at our instance page two. And on instance page two, if we were to look at just alpha, right, just the alpha channel, which remember is down here, A, and our alpha channel corresponds, of course, to what's going on over here in our image, right? So by just drawing alpha, or just applying alpha to our instances, we can see that we're drawing that circle, right? So we're pretty close. If we were to come over here and animate our image in some way, right, so like let's grab an LFO, And let's do something um, easy. Let's go ahead and make this a Gaussian shape. And let's attach it to a math. And in our math, let's go ahead and specify that our range should be uh, maybe like 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. Let's double check what's going on over here in our top. Mm, let's make that 0 0.4 instead. Well, let's go ahead with our LFO and let's uh, drive the size of this guy. So we can drive the radius, both in X and in Y. And now we can see we've got this lovely little kind of like bouncing shape here, right? That's, it's silly and it's lovely. Uh, that's great. But we can also now see that sure as shooting text, we are animating uh, our instances with this image. Now that means that we could feed this anything that we wanted. In fact, let's go ahead and view this. And let's scooch it down here. We'll shrink its size a little bit. Now, it's important to remember that we're only looking at alpha right now. So if we were to go ahead and add an image, uh, sure, let's grab a movie file in. And our banana, if we were to go ahead and plug that right into our fit. We would see that nothing happened, and you might think, Matt, you've let me led me astray. And that's because over here, our top two is set up to do the download type as next frame. So we're a frame behind over here. So let's just go ahead and force cook that once. In general, if we have something that are, that's moving, if we're a single frame behind, um, that doesn't bother me, and it's much cheaper computationally. So I'm happy with, uh, happy to let that go. Perfect. So now we've got a banana. That's pretty cool, all right? So that would lead you to believe that something like uh, noise also would be something that you could draw. 
And let's go ahead and give this a little bit of movement. And we can use abs time uh, dot frame. That's probably a little bit too fast. Let's do abs time seconds. Animating our noise, and so we plug our noise in here. And, whoop, oh, I wonder if we've got just like a little bit too much density. Let's go ahead and um, change up our output here. Let's put our noise in. Ha, ah, perfect. For our alpha, and again, because what we were seeing happen, if we go back to zero, there's no alpha in this image. Oops. One, excuse me. There's no alpha in this image, and so the only alpha that exists is here at the periphery, which is why we don't see anything happen. So we need to do like noise for our alpha, for example, and now we can see this kind of shimmery effect here in our, here in our instances. Now, this is all well and good, but what if we wanted color in here? Well, let's go ahead and specify that the R, G, B, and A channels, and those correspond over here to R, G, B, and A. So those channels are what we actually want to look at. And now, if we were to come back to our noise and say, for example, turn off this monochrome business, we would see that we've got some color noise in here. Now, this doesn't extend to the bounds, right? We've got this funky thing going on. So in our fit, we might decide that we want to go ahead and fit outside. So that's going to fill the frame. All right. So that's, that's getting interesting here. We can crank up the amplitude. The more we play with our, uh, the parameters of our noise, the more we see that change our instances. And what's fun about this is that uh, it's important to remember that what we're dealing with is something that we're actually drawing in 3D space. So not only are we, you know, doing something that's kind of, kind of interesting mildly, um, we're doing this in a way that means that we can explore this dimensionally, right? So we can actually fly through this. We can position our camera kind of on the plane of it. We can really play with our relationship now to what this uh, particular field is that we're drawing, right? We're kind of really pushing our kind of ideas of how we draw pixels and what pixels represent and what they mean. Let's go ahead and, uh, real quick, let's go back to our process channel here. And let's plug our banana back in, just so we can see that our banana does, in fact, uh, come in here. We're going to go ahead and just like move it around just a skosh, um, just because we're still on next frame, download type for our, our uh, top two chop. So again, we can see that we're drawing this banana uh, as pixels here. now. One other thing for us to remember is that our fit here, right, our fit's resolution is being driven by our top over here. So if we were to split our view, and depending on the GPU that you have, um, and depending on what your rig is, you can push this harder or softer, depending on what your resources look like. But we might decide that we want to double this, right? So we might go 60 by 80. We're going to have twice as many instances. Let's draw that at 10 by 16. And that mean, means we're going to need to back our camera off just a little bit more here so we can see more of this. And we might decide that we want to go ahead and plug something in here as our process that's a little bit uh, larger so that we can actually see the whole field. Okay. That gives us a sense of where our camera is going to be happy to live. Right. So we can start to really crank on how many instances we're drawing, and we can really play with this idea of what it means to have this thing that we're drawing in space. Now, we could also decide that we want to rotate this, right? So uh, the actual, the geometry over here. Let's go ahead and give it some rotation. I'll do abs time dot frame. That should give us a nice spinning rotation here. Right, so now we're, we're playing with this idea of drawing a plane, drawing our pixels as an array, uh, and what that, uh, how that might be fun or playful or interesting. Well, we're here. Let's go ahead and just add one other kind of fun element to this. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and dive right back into instances. Now, we saw here, if we were to open up our geo one more time, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and leave my geo open. I'm going to close the, the raster here. This is a more expensive kind of viewport to draw. 
Um, but when we're doing our programming and modeling, it's used really um, more useful, I think, to have something that you can kind of pan around and see a little bit. So we've got this thing that we've drawn, and these are all perfectly pew, flat, right? There's like no variation in their height at all. So we might play with some of this idea a little bit. Before we do that, let's go ahead and do one other thing. Like, let's see what happens if we were to draw a box instead. So if we were to use a box here in our geo, right? So in our geo that's being instanced, let's grab that. And we happen to know that 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 is a great size. We're going to turn off the display and render flag for our circle. We'll turn it on for our boxes. And now we've got this like cube field, right? We've got this like QB minefieldy business instead. And we could even take that and we might decide that it's got a lot of Z depth, right? We've got this um, kind of topographical crazy uh, space that we're drawing now. Now there's still a lot of uniform um, elements in this, right? They're all the same height. And they're all placed in the same place in terms of depth. So let's see what we could do to play with that a little bit. So I'm going to switch us back to our circles here for a hot second, um, just because it'll be a little bit easier to see. We're going to head back over to our instances. I'm going to buy us back a little bit extra space. And we'll scooch this down. So in instances, let's go ahead and let's make a little space here. We're going to scoot these guys down. We're going to scoot these over. And we're going to play one of my favorite games, which is we're going to select out. Actually, we don't even have to select out. We can just go ahead and make some noise. So we're going to go ahead and drop in a noise chop. And we need to make a few changes to this. So first up, let's go ahead and on the transform, excuse me, on the channel page, we're going to call this TZ because we're going to actually modify the Z position of all of these instances. Uh, on the constraints, oh, excuse me, still on the channel page, we're going to make a few other changes here. Let's go ahead and switch this to being samples. So we're going to specify the beginning and end of this. If we were to middle mouse click on here, we'd see that there are 600 samples in here, right? 0 to 599, that's 600 samples. And what we want to do is we want to go ahead and look at the operator called null1, and I want to find the number of points, so num points, out of this puppy. Uh, and I'm going to subtract one from that, because 0 counts as a number here. I'm going to go ahead and copy that parameter. I'm going to come over here to my amplitude. I'm going to use that for my amplitude. And for my period, I'm going to switch that to be samples. We'll drop that in there. And let's go ahead and just end up. Oh. I did a bunch of work there that we didn't have to do. <laughs> Ignore me for one second. We can leave this as one and we can leave the amplitude as one. That's quite all right. We're going to have some repetition in our noise in this particular instance. That's OK. Uh, let's go ahead and replace. So we'll use a replace chop. And our replace chop is going to look for matching um, names. So for example, TZ here is going to get replaced by TZ here. We can plug that in. And we can see now we've got this kind of confetti business, right? We've put in a whole bunch of different random information for where uh, what Z is for these instances. Now, if we look at this, we can see this is a repeating pattern. It's pretty hard to see it here in this business. If we wanted it to be absolutely or a different kind of random, we could go ahead and use random from the drop down here. And we'd get a little bit more uh, officially random noise, a different kind of pseudo random. Now, if we were to also think about what happens if we switch this up again, so instead of drawing our circles, let's draw our boxes. Now, yeah, we've got this like crystalline-like structure um, that's really interesting. That's really fun. So let's go ahead and turn that off for a second. And if we were to look here at our, our render of this, right, this is really getting kind of fun and playful. And again, we could play with uh, thinking about where our camera sits, right? We could move up or down. This would be more fun if we were to add a null. Um, 
component. So in the component, we're going to add a null, grab that onto our camera, and use that as our look at. So that means that as we move our camera up, down, left, and right, we're still maintaining a, a look at point. So now we can really play with this in an interesting way that's got a lot of kind of like jiggle and jive to it. So this is still just noise, right? But if we were to come back here, let's plug our circles back in. We've got this crazy circular situation. If we were to plug our banana back in, and we take our banana and scooch it around just like to the left or right a little bit. There we go. Right, now we're really starting to have something that we can play with in an interesting and uh, creative way. Okay, so with that in mind, that's one of these pieces that's uh, kind of working and jamming. But what happens when we want to think about that in terms of time? What happens when we want to push that in a dimension um, that starts to look something more like this, right? How do we draw a history of what was happening in this image rather than just drawing a single slice of it? This is all well and good, um, but I want to push a boundary a little bit harder. I want to make uh, dimensional elements out of our, uh, what we typically think of as a flat raster. All right, tune in for installment three and we will dive right in.